Thank you, David. My name's Will Wooten. I'm a, a lecturer at um, King's College London in the Department of Classics. And it's my job to give you a sort of freewheeling 20 to 30 minutes sort of tour through um, the ancient world and how mosaics were made a little bit. Um, by ancient, I mean Greco-Roman. So we are going to be around the Mediterranean. I'm going to touch upon mosaics from probably the 5th or 4th century BC, so 2,400 odd years ago, right up until maybe about the 4th century, but I won't go much later because um, that is uh, Eileen's uh, territory. And I'm going to be focusing really on aspects of history, aspects of making, uh, making both in terms of production, how things were made, um, but also about uh, craftspeople, who these uh, individuals were. And I'm also going to focus quite a lot on experience. So the experiences that mosaics produced within uh, users, visitors, um, but also perhaps think a little bit about um, the experience of the makers. Now, I have a very, very short space to do this in. So um, it will be a little bit freewheeling um, and uh, we'll just see uh, where we get to. So let's start at a, at a place that we can all imagine, which is the eruption of Vesuvius in AD 79 um, and Pliny. Uh, Pliny the Elder, who went in to try to go and rescue people uh, at Pompeii um, and uh, lost his life. Pliny uh, the Elder at this point had been, um, had almost completed, um, or at least um, completed but without revisions, a natural history. Um, and in that natural history, towards the end, he includes uh, a number of um, books about art, um, which essentially has formed um, the basis for, to some degree, our version of art history. Um, and he doesn't really speak very much about mosaics, um, but there is one passage, one passage where he's uh, been talking about various aspects of, um, of art, sculpture, painting, and he decides to include something about mosaic. And he says, paved floors originated among the Greeks, were skillfully embellished with a kind of paintwork until this was superseded by mosaic. In this latter field, the most famous exponent was Sosus, who at Pergamon, Pergamon is a city um, uh, in modern Turkey, and we'll come back to that. Uh, Sosus laid the floor of what is known in Greek as the aceroton oikon, the unswept room, because by means of small cubes tinted in various shades, he represented on the floor refuse from the dinner table and other sweepings, making them appear as if they had been left there. A remarkable Detail in the picture is a dove which is drinking and casts the shadow of its head on the water while others are sunning and preening themselves on the brim of a large drinking vessel. For Pliny, um, he includes these because this Hellenistic world that Sosus comes from, so Sosus um, is operating in probably somewhere in the second century, uh, so at least a couple of hundred years before uh, Pliny is writing this. Um, and Pliny's interested in this extraordinary conceit of the unswept floor, which I'm going to show you. Um, and he's also interested in this extraordinary ability to create something which is so visually amazing. Um, the ability in small stones to depict uh, water on which can have a reflection of a bird sitting on a brim of a vessel. Okay. So, of course, these things do survive. We can go to, this is an example of these doves of Pliny, which have massive uh, uh, reverberations through the history of art um, into micro mosaics of the 17th, 18th and 19th century um, and right up to the present day. These, uh, this mosaic laid to go on a floor was part of Hadrian's Villa, part of um, a vista of extraordinary um, extraordinary and famous um, art products. This may not be Sosus's original, um, because Hadrian's Villa is built in the early 2nd century AD, so a few hundred years after, um, but we know that this may well be actually 
um, an antique mosaic by the time that Hadrian installs it um, in his villa. And you have your doves. One thing that we don't have um, is the reflections on the water. And modern uh, contemporary scholars still argue about whether this is Sosis's doves or some sort of version after that original. I should say that the pieces um, in this mosaic are around about one to two millimetres across in size. Um, so I could uh, draw a dot of about that size um, and uh, that's the sort of size of the, of the tesserae. Uh, this is just a, a, a picture, a reconstruction of Hadrian's villa. And this is, um, this is the unswept floor. Now you've got to remember that what you're looking at um, are vertical images that should, of course, be horizontal. So your experience is already as if these things are like pictures on walls, whereas, of course, you're experiencing this um, as a floor. And what is so amazing about this mosaic? Um, in a way, what's so amazing is its modernity, um, is the fact that Sosus, in this uh, um, in, this, in the Attalid kingdom, which is where uh, Pergamon was, uh, Sosus decides that he can play with the whole notion of space, with the whole notion of solidity, um, by effectively depicting a floor, right? Because this is a mosaic of a mosaic floor. Um, but on that floor are the leftovers of a dinner, right? So it's it signals a very particular moment in time, a moment when the dinner has happened because you need the dinner to produce the refuse, the rubbish. Um, and this floor would have been in a room where you would have dined, so it was very appropriate to the place because you're actually eating on a floor that has the refuse from a dinner. Um, but of course, at the same time, the ref refuse from your own dinner would become intermingled amongst the depicted refuse. So it's quite possible that you may try to lean down and pick up um, something that you've dropped and mistakenly try to pick up something that was actually depicted on the floor. Um, and that clearly would have created certain resonances, certain sort of extraordinary uh, responses of your own as you looked at and realized what it was that you were um, uh, dealing with. I mean, this game has been played uh, right up to the present day. But I think Sosus is a very clever originator of an idea of how a mosaic can be used to evoke, um, to reflect function in terms of a room, um, but also play very carefully, carefully and cleverly um, with the people who are experiencing that room. And remember that the people sitting and dining, you know, would have had other aspects, wine, food, and so forth, that, that may have um, further affected um, their okay. senses. Can I ask, do you know that border, is that part of the mosaic? Because it looks yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a border. This is this is um, a, a mosaic that comes from second century Rome, um, and it has a set of other borders around. And it's designed so this section actually sits just in front of the dining couches, exactly where you have your tables and exactly where the food um, uh, falls falls down. Now this idea continues right uh, to the present day. You can. Uh, be in um, Boston and you can see these sidewalks that have bronze newspapers and leaves um, inserted into the, the, cement, um, the cement pavement or maquettes, in this case Michelle Weinberg uh, for um, uh, LA and, and mosaics that play the same sort of game. Now, both of the mosaics that I've shown you are actually from Rome and its surroundings from Italy and are later than Sosus, later than this uh, mosaicist. So we can actually go to Pergamon. Um, these are reconstructions of the ancient city. It's a very famous city with an extraordinary uh, collection of um, architecture. But this is a mosaic that actually comes from Pergamon. It's not made by Sosus, um, and we know that because it's actually signed by Hephaestion. Hephaestion, uh, this is the Greek, Hephaestion epoie. Hephaestion made it. Um, but this is made about the same time that Sosus probably was in Pergamon. 
And it's an extraordinary, clever mosaic that plays exactly the same game that Sosus actually played himself. So what you're seeing, again, is a, is a floor. And this is Hephaestion's calling card. It is um, a, a piece of parchment that he's depicted in mosaic. Again, tiny, tiny pieces, which are stuck down at three corners with um, wax. But one corner, the wax has come away and the piece of parchment peels up and shows you the underside. Now that's really, really clever. But what's even more clever about this mosaic is that at this time, the Attalids uh, 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 kings are having a really big argument with the Ptolemies. The Ptolemies are based in Alexandria, a modern Egypt, um, and they're having an argument over libraries. Um, and to build libraries, you need things to write on. And the Ptolemies have access uh, to papyrus, um, which they develop. And they decide to put an export ban on papyrus to the Attalid uh, kings so that they can't build their library. So that um, the, the Ptolemies basically can, can advance in their sort of intellectual and cultural uh, way further than the, um, the Attalids. So what the Attalids do is that they develop parchment um, so that they can also um, uh, store their, their books and their writings. Um, and so what Hephaestion does very clever is record that by actually using parchment in his mosaic. Okay, so I want to now take you, so we, we've, I want to take you to Carthage, another city that, uh, uh, from antiquity, so uh, modern Tunisia now, on the North African coast, um, where we have an extraordinary range of mosaics from the very, very earliest mosaics, probably built... Uh, or probably made as part of uh, Punic Phoenician cultures um, around the 5th century BC and onwards. And I'll just show you two examples. Contemporary scholars still argue about whether this is the place that mosaic, uh, modern mosaic, tessellated mosaic, um, actually, actually originates. But I want to go a little bit later. Um, so uh, the, this, where are we? Over here. Um, so, in the Roman period, they develop this area. It's a very fancy sort of elite area. Um, and all these houses are very nice. You get lovely, cool air. Any of you have been to Tunisia, this sort of cool breezes are very important um, in the summer periods. Um, and I want to look at a house which is just here, which is this one here. Um, and what's very extraordinary about this is that in the third century, they do something very, very strange. Um, they make a mosaic that is a tiger skin, right, um, on the floor, okay? So it's a tiger laid out, splayed out, um, just in the way that, you know, 19th century aristocrats um, or 19th century elites in Europe and um, in America, you know, they were subscribing to exactly this idea that tiger skins could have value, could signal hunting and leisure and all of those sorts of things. Um, but this person sticks this uh, uh, lion skin right at the back of a, of a redeveloped house. And it's very unclear why they do this, but it's probably not the same sort of ideas of, of 19th century Britain, um, of of sort of ideas of personal hunting, but this may connect very much to the amphitheater, to pub big public events of, of um, where individuals showed their largesse, um, improved their social status, um, and were, were basically seen as benefactors by putting on these big games. And this may be a tiger skin from a real tiger acquired probably, well, has to come from um, India and maybe as part of one of those grand events. But at the same time, what it does is exactly the same thing that Sosus is doing, i.e. it has no geometric set of borders. There's no um, control of this as a, a, as a mosaic that shows a picture. Rather, the visitor can experience this in a way that is unmediated, i.e. they can walk in and think, wow, a tiger skin. 
And it's only then in the second realization can they go on to realize that this is a mosaic of a tiger skin. And then you can realize the time, the labor, the effort, and all of those things that goes into making something like this. So, of course, mosaic is a highly experiment exper experiential uh, medium. It's one that requires to be looked at, one that requires to be walked on. Um, and one example of this is a, is a mosaic of um, George Bush Sr. Um, inserted into a hotel in Baghdad, where the mosaic and the image is put into the practice of denigrating an individual who's seen you know, as an enemy, right? So it's a simple way of that you co-opt everyone who walks on, over that mosaic um, into your particular ideology of disrespecting this individual. So you can do things like that. Um, but similar sorts of things go on in antiquity where it's clear that what you're meant to do is experience space and move around it. So this is a mosaic from um, Spain, um, early Roman imperial mosaic, where you see a useful Dionysiac character, a character associated with Dionysus, Bacchus, the god of wine, carrying um, a pedum. This is a little sort of hunting stick. Um, and once you walk over it, you can see the other side, which is um, a bearded Dion a Dionysiac figure on the other side. So you can move between the two. Now, you have to move around it to see it. I mean, this is the equivalent of... Um, the mad comic, the mad comics on the back, you always had one that you either folded the bit of paper or you turned it upside down. Um, um, and it required that engagement and um, an interest in that mosaic um, to actually activate it, to see it, to understand it. So mosaics function exactly in that way. They're not static um, uh, objects because they demand you to engage and experience and walk um, and, th and, and act upon or be acted upon by those mosaics. This is one of Medusa, the uh, famous or infamous um, uh, female gorgon um, who can turn people to stone with her amazing powerful vision. And of course you know, this geometric motif around it is not just about something pretty and attractive. It actually itself acts in a way that um, is meant to amaze or disturb your vision um, and is a physical um, depiction of exactly that powerful vision that Medusa um, has. Of course, on the other hand, the extraordinary conceit and game that's going on here is that Medusa is meant to turn you to stone, except in this instance, Medusa herself has been turned to stone and turned to stone for a particular purpose of being sort of harnessed by the owner and the user to then, you know, ward off evil and things like that. So she acts um, um, as a sort of good luck type charm. Um, and of course, all of these... Um, uh, sort of visual games um, harness again clear understandings of geometry um, and the way that the human eye sort of tries to figure out things like exactly this looks like a spiral but it's not you know those sorts of uh, fun and games and these things become um, quite popular at the moment and I just want to show you one example that you've probably all seen has anyone seen this one or not yeah um, well, I'll just show you, uh, have to, ah, we do get it, right, so, oh, here we go, so here it is, here he is walking, this is a, a ceramic studio in Manchester, and um, where they've just had this floor installed, um, and it's um, all about uh, the, the pleasure of um, exactly that sort of a uh, geometric game. Right. But of course, if you turn that around, and I hope this is the right one, here he is walking straight over it, right? Do you, do you get the difference there?
Okay. <coughs> we'll leave him doing that in the background. And if you turn it around, all that's happening here is that this is a flat floor, of course. That, you know, that it's just simply the laying that makes it look like an uneven surface. Um, and that visual game that's being played here by a studio um, in Manchester is exactly what's going on 2,000 odd years ago. Um, so this is no inventive or innovative thing. I mean, it's simply harnessing an idea that is incredibly old. So um, what's really important is not just to think about these things, I guess, in experiential ways, but understand the active um, making that goes into um, these sorts of mosaics. And, and of course, in, for the ancient world, um, I mean, we can go and speak to the Manchester uh, uh, tile makers and find out about them. But for the Roman, uh, the Greek, uh, the Byzantine, um, we rely on that archaeological evidence. Um, yeah. Partly on that textual, I've so shown you a bit of textual, um, and we have some uh, visual evidence. This may well be uh, mosaic makers uh, from Ostia, uh, the main uh, port of Rome, cutting a tesserae. And if you look at that hammer, um, and when we go out and Paola shows you um, her hammer and hardy, you'll see um, some fairly uh, close um, resemblances. But we have other nice bits of evidence that help us to think about um, who's involved in the making of these mosaics. And I show you another example that you may have seen um, that was uh, a very... Um, <coughs> Uh, very much highlighted in the media. This is the Lod mosaic from Israel. And when they lifted this uh, mosaic, what they found underneath were these things. Um, and what these are, I hope you can recognise, are the footprints. The footprints of the people involved in tamping down the um, part of the mortar bedding um, into the, the rubble core underneath. And what's so fascinating about these is not just footprints, it's not just that ability to touch the past um, through, you know, that, the sort of, the fingerprint, um, is that actually these are two very different things. One person's wearing a shoe or shoes, the other person is barefoot. Um, and whichever poor person is tamping down lime mortar with their bare feet, it tells us something perhaps about their social status, who they were, could they not afford shoes? Um, did they think that doing it without shoes was better? I mean, lime can obviously burn um, skin. And so this um, rather questions um, the sort of uh, individual um, that had to do this. Were they a slave um, uh, or, or whatever? But also, importantly, um, it doesn't just give insight to individuals that we wouldn't otherwise see, right? Because most of the mosaics we see are finished, probably used by elites, wealthy individuals who could afford them. This gives us social levels that you otherwise don't get. Um, and the size of some of these feet suggests that we either have women or children um, working on site. Um, and this is uh, a very interesting part of sort of ongoing research to try to fill out um, uh, a social history of artistic production uh, where we simply um, have very little evidence. Um, and, you know, there are other uh, bits of material that we do have, things like um, this, uh, very occasional insights again into this is another, uh, this is a mosaic from Tunisia, possibly of another mosaic maker. Um, perhaps working with a young uh, apprentice-type uh, individual, maybe even um, his uh, son. Um, and again, from this, we can formulate uh, ideas about the construction of the craft, how it worked, how knowledge was passed on, um, and so forth. Of course, a lot of what we do, again, relies on that long history of making. Um, the long history that David has um, referred to. Um, but that in itself impacts um, the way that we look at the past. 
Um, and in particular, those uh, 19th century makers um, about whom I'm also very interested about how they made their mosaics, how they developed um, techniques to respond to particular economic or market conditions. This is um, uh, the famous Antonio Salviati, who did a lot of work, um, including one that you may well recognize, the um, uh, uh, Apple store on Regent Street recently um, uh, re reconserved. And, and what interests me here is, is how we in our present look at the past and especially the historic interference of particular techniques developed um, at moments in time. So Salviati uh, develops ways of making mosaics in reverse so that they can be moved around, easily installed. Um, but one of the issues for contemporary academics is many apply contemporary techniques to um, the past and that needs some consideration. And it needs some consideration because often when we encounter the past, when we encounter these mosaics, like those I've showed you of Sosus, um, what we find are mosaics of extraordinary complexity, um, absolute technical brilliance, um, which rather question um, how they were made. Um, and we tend to uh, think of particular sort of industrialized methods or clever techniques um, to produce uh, things like this, this well-known Alexander mosaic. And here he is again in, in tesserae of um, a couple of millimeters across. And what, um, when you look at the evidence, what you find, these are some beddings of mosaics, is that actually um, these complex, difficult, colourful uh, mosaics from the Greco-Roman world were probably made in situ, by that I mean on site, uh, by hand and directly. Um, they mark up their beddings with grids carefully scored um, into that bedding and then colour, colour even um, full, fully painted synopia, fully painted underpaintings, um, and then lay the mosaic um, over the top. What this shows, um, and if I just go back to the Alexander mosaic, what, what it shows that something like this is not made in a sort of Salviati, Victorian, marketized way, in a studio away from site where they can sit for months or years on end making sure everything's perfect. They actually have extraordinary skills, long traditions of making, and they can do these things uh, very simply, uh, well, very simply and on site. So um, quite often when we think about the past and when we, when we reconstruct that past, and especially makers, uh, these, this is a, an old display from Corinium Museum in Sirencester. Here is a sort of male mosaic maker in his studio, cutting his tesserae um, and perhaps making things away from site. We actually need to think quite differently. Still um, a male, but we, we may well have female mosaicists um, in, antiquity, in antiquity. I think it's highly likely that we did. Um, but making their mosaics... Um, on site with uh, a significant quantity of knowledge, probably a long um, historical tradition behind them, passed on maybe through family groups, um, um, or at least through a system where knowledge um, is passed from one individual to another. So I think you know, that gives you a little sort of overview of some ancient mosaics, of some aspects of experience, of how these mosaics were meant to activate um, the viewer or the viewer was meant to activate them, um, and also aspects of how production is a, is a meaningful thing, one that requires labor, time, experience, um, and something that, you know, for me, still has significant uh, value today. Thank you.